Welcome to ESO Offstage. I'm your host and ESO double bassist, Max Cardilli. In this episode, I'd like to give you an introduction to what Mozart once called the king of instruments. Need a hint? To help us explore the history of this unique instrument, I've enlisted the help of a familiar voice to ESO audiences. My name is D.T. Baker, and I think pretty much since Bach was alive, I've been writing program notes and doing pre-concert lectures as part of my job with the Edmonton Symphony Orchestra. I think the fact that we use the word organ to describe both the magnificent musical instruments, but also use it for, you know, the intestines, for example, speaks to its rather, shall we say, non-specific roots. And in fact, its ancient original Greek meaning, supposedly, was more or less along the lines of that with which one works or uses. So it's kind of a, a catch-all word to begin with. But in only a few centuries, uh, I guess the Romans had decided that the word more specifically meant a musical instrument, you know, however, they applied it to mean pretty much every musical instrument. The instrument that we now know of as the organ was already around at that time, and, and most who have plumbed its history seem to agree that takes us back to Greece circa 200 or so BC. Some histories I've read even ascribe a specific Greek, a man named Tsitsibius, as its inventor, but I'm not really sure that you can credit one man, especially that far back. The notion of forcing air through a tube of a specific length and circumference in order to create a specific pitch is not only an ancient idea, it's, it's pretty universal. I don't know of a culture in the world that doesn't have an instrument that does that. It applies to everything from a pipe organ to a flute to a trombone. But with an organ, and indeed with, with any keyboard instrument, the difference is that a mechanical interceder is used to quite literally manipulate. And I say literally, as manipulate means to use the hand to act upon something, which in this case is the sounding of the pipes. The ancient Greek instrument was powered by water, into which air would be pumped and from which pressurized air would be sounded through the tubes. That's actually a bit of a mechanical marvel in its own way, but that has been really a characteristic of organs from the get-go. But using water in that way is also fairly cumbersome, and by the last century BC, we get references to a bellows system being used to pump the air rather than water pressure. I think many of us still tend to think of the instrument as being most at home in places of worship. And the grander the edifice, the grander the organ built for it must be. But this was certainly not always the case. I mean, for one thing, while singing psalms and hymns of praise seem to have been part of the, the early Christian church dating back to its Jewish roots and even earlier, the use of instruments in the early church seems to have been frowned upon. Uh, there's a book uh, called The Story of Christian Music, which quotes a 4th century manuscript saying, and I'm quoting here, in blowing on the tibia, they puff out their cheeks, they lead obscene songs, they raise a great din with the clapping of scabella, under the influence of which a multitude of other lascivious souls abandon themselves to bizarre movements of the body." Unquote. This was by no means universal. There were parts of the faith, especially ones located more in the Middle East, that tolerated some instruments. Uh, you know, the lyre, it was argued, had been played by David, after all. The further west you went, maybe not so much. St. Jerome, for example, regarded any instrument as a pagan influence. 
But the church did relent, though very gradually, to the use of instruments in praise of its God. There's a tantalizing bit from someone named Odo, who was the abbot of Cluny in eastern France, which dates from about 942 AD. And it's about monks being accompanied in their singing by a hurdy-gurdy, which uses a keyboardish mechanism to play upon strings. But the instrument that led the way for the music in the church, beginning in about the 10th or 11th century, was in fact the organ. It was already being used to summon people to church, and now it began to accompany the music for the Mass. The instrument itself was a much rougher version of what it would become, and part of the reason for that is that there was very little in the way of standardization. We know of only a few instruments from the pre-Renaissance that are around in any form now, and those that are show a number of interesting features. The, the size of the keys that are used to sound a pipe, for example, was not only not standardized from instrument to instrument, but was not even standardized even on its own keyboard. Uh, a much larger key might be used to sound a larger pipe on the early instruments, and early performers describe using all kinds of ways of getting to all the notes, including using the fists, the knees, whatever total body workout was needed, I guess, to make the music. Another limiting factor was that harmony was still a bit of a thorny issue for the early church. Certain sound combinations were considered more allowable than others, so the range of notes available on the early organs was limited to what was permissible. But as the Middle Ages gave way to the Renaissance, all, um, all heaven broke loose, and music praising God became more and more intricate and more elaborate, more grand. Then the Reformation kicked off a real sort of our composers are grander than yours bit of competition as well. And, you know, it's funny. I mean, pride is considered one of the deadly sins, but to have the, the grandest music and the grandest organs upon which to play it seems to have been very much a matter of pride among churches. The organ is the ideal instrument for this, of course. Each organ is custom built for the space, and more space meant more organ. More pipes, more ranks, more manuals, whatever could work. In the days before orchestras were ever even really a thing, a cathedral organ could make sounds that nothing else could compete with. And of course, with money and power and bigger and better comes fancier and gaudier, and an organ is a hell of a thing to dress up. Um, there are Byzantine and, and Baroque stories of men of power and wealth throughout Europe and the Middle East having organs built for them, designed with gold and jewels, given as gifts and, and built as status symbols. I mean, you know, they could also play music, but that was hardly the point with those instruments anyway. You don't necessarily need to take a long trip to find a wonderful organ. There is one housed here at the Winspear Center with a very special story. We're very fortunate that our wonderful concert hall in Edmonton, the Francis Winspear Center for Music, is also home to one of the finest concert organs in the world, the Davis Concert Organ. So how good is it? Well, quick story. When the organ made its public debut in 2002, uh, the first performer to present a complete solo recital on it was Christopher Herrick, the renowned British organist who's quite well known for his series of recordings on the Hyperion label called Organ Fireworks. Now, this series would feature him playing all kinds of bravado organ pieces on some of the great organs around the world. So he came here, and after he played his solo recital, he went back to the UK, told the folks at Hyperion that his next organ fireworks recording would be done on the Davis Concert Organ. And he came back the following year and recorded Organ Fireworks 10 on our wonderful instrument. And we're actually quite proud of that. My name is Gerald Islander. I am the orchestra operations manager for the Edmonton Symphony Orchestra, and I'm also the organ curator for Canada's largest concert pipe organ, the Davis Concert Pipe Organ. Now, why is it called the Davis Concert Organ? Oh, Dr. Stuart Davis. I love telling this story. It's, it's just, yeah, I'm smiling underneath my mask that I have on right now telling this. Back in the 80s, 
an organ committee formed uh, as a subgroup from the Linton Concert Hall Foundation that was building the Winspear Center. They developed this organ committee that was based of many organists in the city to put together their ideas of what an organ should be in a symphony concert hall. They had money put aside to it, but was never enough. Then one day, this gentleman knocked on our door and asked if he could talk to somebody about donating some money to the organ fund. So the security officer called somebody from upstairs and said, hey, we have somebody here that wants to donate some money. And sure enough, it was this gentleman that wants to donate over a million dollars. And we said, well, let's go upstairs. Let's have a cup of coffee and talk about this. And this gentleman was a subscriber for the symphony since 1957. And his name was Dr. Stuart Davis. He was a chemistry professor at the University of Alberta. And him and his wife, Winona, uh, went to the symphony, to the Jubilee Auditorium since 1957 when they got married. So that was part of their fabric of who they are. They loved music so much. Uh, but in 1994, Winona passed away. Uh, Dr. Davis bought a ticket and he sat up in the top balcony and he saw this empty space at the back of the orchestra that needed an organ. So his friend said, okay, you're 81 years old. What are you going to do with your money? Why keep it in your will? Why don't you do something with it now when you can actually hear it? And that's why he decided to knock on our door at the Winspear. Going back to the organ gala in 2002, Dr. Stuart Davis had asked if he could come to the dress rehearsal where there was 65 musicians in the orchestra and the organ was playing and everybody was involved and it was such a celebration of community spirit. And after the rehearsal was done, he walked up to the side of the stage and he says, thank you so much, but I have to let you know, whenever I hear this organ play, I hear my wife's voice sing. I mean, it's really the Winona Davis concert organ. This probably would have sat empty if it wasn't because of him. He was the largest arts philanthropist in the country in 2000. It's the jewel of the Winspear because it's this beautiful thing that kind of completes the concert hall. Anybody who's been here before without it would know the difference where they had this blue empty space where we kind of lit corporate logos to now fitting this magnificent instrument that has, oh, I think 1,500 pipes on the outside, but really it has 6,551 pipes in all. I've heard people say this instrument is the king of instruments. It can do everything. Sure, it may look a little bit scary to some because they just don't know enough about it, but they want to know about it. Uh, it's, I think part of it's because they have these beautiful trumpets that are sticking out. And these trumpets are called enchimades. And I often say they're so loud, they're in, enough to part your hair. Think of an organ as sort of like a furnace in your house. If the house gets colder, you want to turn up the heat. And once you turn up a thermostat, a fan gets in motion inside your furnace to create wind, to kind of heat up your house. It's the same thing for here. You turn on a switch, there are four blowers in the blower room that turn on and it pushes wind through wind ducts. And then the wind ducts then go to um, the reservoirs to hold the wind. And then from there, there's more wind ducts that go to different rooms inside this instrument, just like rooms in your house. That wind then gets transferred to uh, the wind chest, which is where all the pipes are sitting on. And so you have to just press a key and then the wind just goes to that pipe that you designated to or which ones you're playing. Think of it also this way. This, Like I said, this has 96 stops. Think of it as, as a, a painter that's trying to create a portrait or a landscape painting and has all these different colors to choose from. And it was a little bit of orange and a little bit of yellow and some red and some purple to create this sort of color. The same thing happens as an organist. You have all these different colors to choose from to create this sort of painting. From what I understand, there's a key and it's there's almost like an ignition yep. in the it, car. It's very tiny. Look, how, it's really small. I actually think it's the same key that works for every organ because <laughs> it looks the same as any other one. Um, well, you can't really steal an organ. So. You can't really steal it. It's not going anywhere. Um, but yeah, you, the blower room is actually behind uh, a concrete wall that's beside this instrument. And so you can kind of hear from a distance the wind kind of blowing through. And then you can, if we open up the doors, you'll be able to see the wind bellows actually lifting up. Ready? 
go. One of my favorite stops is the tuba. Not every instrument gets to have a tuba. And if they have one, most often it's not in a box. Um, but in this instrument, this tuba is in a box and you can just use one of your foot pedals to close the box to make it sound quieter. It's so beautiful. Tuning it is not so beautiful. <laughs> It is so loud, it makes your ears ring. Other one, it's clarinet. It's such a gorgeous clarinet. The big reeds on the grate. But they have all these 16 foot pipes that are just make you, that makes you grumble. They have these beautiful string section. Uh, the quietest ones is on the on the, the positive. And then a sort of little bit bigger sound comes in the swell division. big orchestral strings is in the big bombard division. You can put them all together on one keyboard. And there's a whole array of flutes. Uh, the big harm flute harmonique. There's a chimney flute. Those are all eight foot ones. Now you get smaller ones that are the four foot flutes. And then it's beautiful two foots. And then the smallest pipe, like it's really smaller than a pencil that you have at home. You'd never play that on its own. You need it with other pipes to make it sound properly. Now, there's the Spanish trumpets that we talked about before. Um, that's just one of them. And there are, there's a whole two other octaves of them. But there's also another one called the Bombard. And and there's a whole bunch of other reeds that you add to it. But pedals, you always think that that's the base of the instrument, but actually, it actually has some of the most beautiful little pipes as well. And you can put the melody in your feet. It doesn't have to be just the foundation. And all these keyboards, there's four for your hands and one for your feet. Um, you can exchange all these keyboards and put it all together with all these different tablets that you see in front of me. So, um, like a, the principle stops here. Is the foundation of the instrument and then it just kind of builds from there. chest feel it in your chest <laughs> so everything rumbles <laughs> felt like I was gonna need to take my inhaler <laughs>
you climb all the way to the very top of this instrument, you'll see the signatures of all the people who assembled it here. It's just what you do in the organ world. There's some images of, of cats and people's faces and caricatures and all that kind of stuff, which is really awesome. I play f organ for First Baptist Church here, and they have a 1955 instrument. Letourneau just happened to be the, the contractor to rebuild it about four years ago. So the gentleman that I know went over to First Baptist Church to um, disassemble it and assemble it and they saw their father's names on that instrument and it just kind of came to life to them it's like wow all this knowledge gets carried on from generation to generation things haven't really changed much in 350 years there's a book out of france that uh about how to build pipe organs from 1736 i think it is and all organ builders use that book it is um, a book on the art of organ building by um, by a monk, Dom Bedos is the is the author of this book. It's got some just absolutely beautiful artwork in it. I mean, they're, they're they're technical designs and sort of section views through pipe organs done by hand. But um, it tells you with 18th century technology um, everything you need to know to build this an 18th century pipe organ in the French style. My name is Andrew Forrest, and I am the Vice President and Artistic Director for the company, Letourneau. Uh, I've been with the company for 22 years. I know the Davis organ very well. The, the organ plays with, with sound and acoustics and spatial perception in a way that many instruments can't even touch. And I think that's what really attracts me to the instrument, that, that um, we often say that you know, the most important stop on any pipe organ is actually the room that it's in. It's, it's something of a cliche in the organ business, um, but it's true. It's, it's absolutely true that, that um, the organ has to be adapted to the room that it's in. And you really need to take advantage of the room's qualities to make a successful pipe organ. In the building of an organ like the Davis Concert Organ, where you're building it across the country and you're not necessarily building it in the space that it's destined for. How do you how do you negotiate the acoustical properties of a space that that is like so far away? In some cases, not the Davis per se, but in some cases you can go to the space and get a sense of what the space is like before the instrument is built. Uh, in the case of the Windspear Center, well, the building really wasn't finished before some decisions had to be made about what the instrument was going to sound like. But uh, in working with the acousticians and the architects, uh, we had a pretty good sense of what the hall was going to sound like, uh, and so could design the organ accordingly. Um, there's that. The other question that, as an organ builder, uh, we have to ask ourselves is, okay, how is this instrument going to be used? Um, and a concert hall organ is a very special breed. There are excellent pipe organs in churches across the country. But an instrument in a concert hall has to do more than a church organ um, because, you know, the, the symphony orchestra is sitting right in front of the pipe organ. Um, and the instrument has to blend just superbly with the symphony. Uh, at times, it has to be sort of in dialogue with the symphony. So it needs to be able to match the symphony decibel for decibel. All that to say that the, uh, an instrument in, in the concert hall needs to be powerful when needed, but also needs to have a lot of color and dynamic control built into it. We have teams that just specialize in installations. Depending on the size of the instrument, it can take two weeks. It can sometimes take three months. It just, it just depends on, on how large the instrument is. The Davis organ was installed in two phases. Um, and the first phase of the instrument was installed in this it was in 2001 uh, and i was part of the team that was in edmonton installing the facade of the organ in the hall and then in the summer of 2002 uh, there was another team that came out to edmonton and installed a good portion of the organ behind the facade uh, and then the instrument was ready to play later that fall for the instrument's opening and with the Edmonton Symphony Orchestra.
Like how do you tune a, how do you tune an organ like this? It takes about fifty to sixty hours to retune the entire instrument. Um, like I said, there's six thousand five hundred fifty-one pipes, and we touch them all. There's a main sound that every organ is built on. It's a uh, there's different languages. It's called diapason or a prestant or an octave, or in French it's a montre. And that is the basis of your instrument that you tune the whole entire instrument around. The way to tune it is like open up a can of spam. When you grab a key and you scroll that metal around, that's the same way as how you tune that pipe. There is rolled metal at the back of it. And you move that scroll up or down to get it at the right pitch. And with flutes, flutes have either a cap that's inside the pipe or that's placed on the outside, and you adjust that cap to get it to the right pitch. Uh, a trumpet or an oboe or a trombone or a bassoon or bombard, um, those kind of reed sounds, they call it. Uh, they have a metal wire that is on the, on the outside of the pipe that you adjust up and down. And inside the Winchest, at the bottom of the pipe, that wire is attached to a tongue. And the tongue is kind of like a reed on a clarinet. But to clean it is a whole other whole other story. Do you ever go inside just to collect your thoughts or think? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, one of the organ builders actually proposed to his fiance inside this instrument. The means by which the proper sound is made in pretty much any organ is very highly dependent upon any number of rather ingenious mechanical or electric or hydraulic or electronic contrivances. I'm told I'm allowed to mention an online course that I will be presenting beginning March 1st. Details on our website, windspearcenter.com, which I've called The Beautiful Machines. It's a history of keyboard instruments, as well as the great composers and performers of keyboard instruments. And I deliberately chose the name, The Beautiful Machines, because of the, the great breadth of amazing music that has been written for the keyboards, but also because I argue that in the Western musical tradition, no other instruments have benefited as much from technology as have keyboard instruments. I mean, just look at the sheer number of instruments that we call organs. If you mention an organ to a lover of, of Bach or Messiaen, the great cathedral instruments with vast numbers of pipes rumbling with the voice of God come to mind. But if you mention organ to a rock and roll lover, it's the Hammond B3 or the, the C3. Our own Davis concert organ at the Winspear Center, for example, is a perfect late 20th century combination of new and old. Air is still forced through any or all of its 6,551 pipes by means of blowers, but the blowers are powered by electricity. There's a full range of registrations available, of course, but these registrations can be saved digitally so that they can be instantly recalled by means of a hard drive. There have been a number of sort of innovations. The biggest one is probably just electricity, starting with organ blowers that replaced people who either operated hand pumps or, or foot pumps. Sometimes you had three, four people all pumping to keep a large pipe organ playing. But the other thing that that sort of ushered in is that with electric blowers, well, suddenly it became possible to get higher and higher wind pressures. Organ builders at that point then began to explore louder and more powerful tones and, and timbres from the instrument. Electricity also allowed the separation of the organ console from the actual instrument. And at the Windsor Center, of course, you've got a, a console on the stage that can be moved just about anywhere on the stage and plugged in and you can play the organ from that organ console. That is all done now, uh, today, through a, um, a closed computer network. The console issues a command and the organ responds. Previous to that, when you would sit at the organ console, it was within the organ case, and you would play a note, and there was a, a system of, of levers and trackers, or, or very sort of narrow uh, strips of wood that connected the key you were playing with your finger through the instrument to the actual valve that allowed the wind into the pipes. Some of the 17th and 18th century instruments uh, in Europe um, and some of the mechanical instruments here in North America, too. Um, you step inside and it's just astonishing 
the thought and the complexity and the engineering that's gone into um, making this this instrument play. It's it's phenomenal. I guess there'll there'll be a, a move to Bluetooth soon enough. The technology does exist, certainly. There are already wireless organ consoles. The day that my phone and and my Bluetooth earbuds stop dropping out and then coming back, that's the day that I'll start subscribing to the idea of organ consoles by Bluetooth. Um, but until then, I, I think we should stick with cables and, and wires. I'll just feel better about it. <laughs> That's something that I've learned. If somebody tells you that they know everything there is to know about pipe organs, be very, very skeptical. No one person can know everything about pipe organs, but we have a big enough team that we can really specialize in just about every area. So we have people who are expert on wind systems. We have people who are experts on uh, wind chest design. We have people who are experts in pipe making. We have expert voicers. If there's uh, a question that really surpasses my level of knowledge about something, well then there's, it's easy to turn to someone else and say, you know, can you fill me in on what I'm missing here? Um, and that's, uh, that's one of the great things about our team. So, yeah. How big is the team? Right now we are at 30, 30 people. That's about as much as our workshop will take. The shop is, is sort of packed to the gills with organ parts and people. And, and so we're, we're always doing a bit of a fine dance with, with our instruments in the shop. If you just look at the facade of the Davis organ, um, there's, there's pipes that are 40 feet tall in the facade. So when those are, when those are lying on their side to be polished, well, you need a, a, a very large room to do that. What, what would you like people to know about the organ? Well, what I'd like people to know, if they don't know anything about the organ, I'd like them to know that it is an awesome instrument to play. And I think some pretty amazing music has been written for it. And I would like more people to listen to good organ music played well on a very fine instrument. And what better instrument than Winspin? I'm Jeremy Spurgeon. I'm organist of All Saints Anglican Cathedral here in downtown Edmonton. I've been here for a number of years. Let's not go into how many years that is. I direct the choir as well here. I play the organ with the Edmonton Symphony Orchestra from time to time, as and when required, when there's organ within uh, a composition. Uh, I was inspired to play the organ um, when I was very, very young and I was listening to a radio program on BBC Radio 4. Well, actually, back then it was BBC Home Service, it was called. And there was a program called Down Your Way in which listeners were interviewed. And then after the interview, he would say, "And which piece have you chosen for us to listen to? And somebody chose to Carter and Fugue in D minor of Bach. And so it was played on the radio, and I was transfixed. And I thought to myself, I want to play that piece. Of course, I haven't even started organ lessons yet, but I, I want to play that piece. That sounds fantastic. So here I am many years later, and I do, in fact, play that piece. I'm just thrilled by the wonderful symphonic sounds an organ can make. I should say that uh, playing the organ, you have to be accurate. Ideally, you have to be accurate, because if you're, if you're not, everybody knows about it. Basically, it's a potential minefield, because I could at any moment hit the wrong thing, or just a slip, and then it's really obvious. So uh, an organist 
ideally has to be completely accurate. It takes a lot of concentration. It's a lot of concentration. And sometimes I concentrate so much, I make a slip, <laughs> which is unfortunate. I've never heard you make a slip before. So. Well, anyway, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> Since organists need to avoid slips with both their hands and their feet, one thing that helps is having the proper footwear. Footwear, that's important. Sometimes there's quite a big gap between one note and the next, and perhaps you have to play it legato or something. So you have to be able to bridge that gap. So you wear uh, a shoe with a good heel. This is about, actually that's about an inch, just an inch and a quarter heel that I'm wearing. Actually, I'm wearing a dancing shoe. It's a soft leather dancing shoe. And you have to be able to feel your way around on the pedal board, especially if you're playing the works of Marcel Dupré. I played his uh, Prelude and Fugue in G minor once. In the Prelude, you've got chords played by the feet, so four notes in the chord. So how do you achieve that? Well, by playing top of the chord with the toe and the next note down with the heel, either heel and toe or toe and heel. So you just have to work out what works. Manipulating these stops, is it, is it dictated by the music, by the composer? Oh uh, yeah, in some cases, yes. For example, in Baroque music, in say the music of Buxtehude or, or Johann Sebastian Bach, they don't indicate anything, I don't think. Um, because you knew back then the sounds that were required to play that sort of piece. Okay. So if you were playing a, a big Toccata and Fugue or a Prelude and Fugue of Bach, I think you probably know that you're going to play on what we call an organo plano, which is a full sound composed of probably an eight-foot pitch, a four-foot pitch, a two-foot pitch, and maybe a mixture. So that's mostly for the big works of Bach. Uh, but then later on, for example, Olivier Messiaen, in the 20th century and César Franck in the 19th century, they would always put at the top of their music and throughout the music, the registration directions, especially Messiaen, he was very particular. And he says, this is what you use for this piece. So now when you say eight foot stop and two foot stop, what, yeah, is this, right. what does this really mean? Okay, so there was, uh, the, the organ is full of ranks of pipes, long lines of pipes. And you can see them if you're sitting in Winspear, you can look up and see all the pipes in front of you. Eight foot pipes. So the longest pipe, as you go up and up the scale, of course, the pipes get smaller and smaller because the smaller the pipe, the higher the sound. So here we have the eight and the four and the two foot. Eight, four, two. So here we have a chorus. We've got a chorus of three voices and they all sound like this. But it sounds like one homogenous sound, doesn't it? Just sounds, it sounds right. It could be this. It's all played, they're all in the eight foot rank. Here's the four foot. And the two foot added. I could get complicated and talk about a mixture stop and the mixture stop, there are three ranks of pipes within this one stop. So th these three ranks, but they're all harmonics of the fundamental. Here's the fundamental. And I could add, actually there are three ranks sounding there. There are three ranks. Okay, there are three sounds you hear, but they're all harmonics of the fundamental. So if you add that into the mix, a very organistic sound that we're very familiar with. So interesting thing about um, uh, pipe lengths, there is a pipe called the Nazar, which its bottom pipe is two and two thirds feet long. That's, well, I'm playing bottom C, but of course it play, it's playing the fifth. It's playing a fifth of the scale. So here's middle C. <laughs> uh, and 
even funnier. Here's the uh, uh, stop called the Tiers, and of course it's one and three fifths feet long. I'm playing bottom C, so it's a, it's a third. And now I'm going to add the Nazard, which is the fifth of the scale. Now I'm going to add the fundamental. So I'm, I'm playing. I'm playing. I've got three stops drawn, and you can hear three sounds. But as I go up the scale, those three sounds are going to meld together, and you'll probably lose track of where those three sounds are, and maybe you'll just hear one sound, but it's a very colorful sound. Okay, but here it is broken down. I'll break it down for you. Here's the eight foot and the Nazard and the Tears. And then move. And we lose the three, but it just becomes a beautiful, uh, rich, colorful sound. Where would you find that in l the literature? Quite a lot in Olivier Messiaen. He, uh, often he prescribes the Tears and the Nazard. And... He's very specific, and you have to have those sounds. What's it like when you see a finished product? <laughs> Overwhelming, usually. It's one of the best feelings. Um, I mean, building a pipe organ takes so much time for the entire team. I remember for the Davis organ, for example, at one point I did some calculations, and I think, I think it was over 50,000 hours of work to build the instrument. When you put that much time into something and it's sort of been a preoccupation in your mind for years, usually, and then finally you see the finished product, to sit at the organ console and play the instrument and sort of explore all the things that you'd sort of imagined for it and to realize that, yeah, yeah, this is, this is exactly what I had in mind. There, there's nothing for it. Here's the wonderful Jeremy Spurgeon again from behind the organ console at All Saints Cathedral with a proper postlude for this episode in true organ fashion. I played, a, I played this piece yesterday. I played Ach Bleib bei uns, Herr Jesu Christ, which is one of the Schubler chorales, so-called Schubler chorales of Bach. And uh, actually five out of the six of them are, can be found in his cantatas. So actually, this piece was originally written for soprano, cello, and basso continuo. And I think it sounds pretty nifty. And it sounds like this. finish off with one more story about the early days of the Winspear Center's Davis Concert Organ. When the, the artisans from Orgue Les Tourneaux were in the months-long process of installing the organ in the Winspear Center, it was decided to have a bit of a public presentation. Now this was still a year out from the actual 2002 debut of the organ, but by this time the facade of pipes had been installed. So. A few hundred guests were invited to come to the Winspear Center for a sneak preview. And the night of the unveiling, unfortunately, was September 11th, 2001. That, that terrible day of so much tragedy and loss of life. I, I remember everyone present at the unveiling was still in shock. They were still grieving, still trying to process the horror of that morning. And it was you know, naturally a, a muted and difficult evening, but 
it was also for me a wonderful reminder of the healing and restorative power of music. Despite the, the, the really palpable grief that we were all feeling, the promise of the music that would be made, the fact that people would come and gather and listen and be enriched by music, as we were at least in some small measure that night, it was a balm in a way. There were tears for sure, but it was part of a healing process that for me is unique to music. In this episode, you heard Jeremy Spurgeon performing Bach's Toccata and Fugue in D minor, as well as excerpts from the Prelude and Fugue in C major performed by Gerald Islander. Thank you to our wonderful guests, Jeremy Spurgeon, D.T. Baker, Gerald Islander, and Andrew Forrest, who shared their time and voices for this episode. In the show notes, you can find links to many resources, including D.T. Baker's upcoming course, The Beautiful Machines, A History of the Keyboard, the Orgue Letourneau Company website, and many links where you can learn more about the Davis Concert Organ. If you're looking for a fun activity, check out the link to our website, where you can even book your very own tour of the Davis Concert Organ. This episode was produced in Emesquichi, Wiskaikin, also known as Edmonton, on the traditional lands referred to as Treaty 6 Territory, a place that has been a meeting ground, traveling route, and home for many Indigenous peoples since time immemorial, including the Cree, Métis, Dene, Nakota Sioux, Soto, and Blackfoot, whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence and enrich our vibrant community. This episode was produced by me, ESO double bassist Max Cardilli. If you want to connect with me about the podcast, you can write to eso.offstage at winspearcenter.com. <laughs>